most of the services that we develop in real time is going to be a dynamic backend only. Okay. So when you choose it as a dynamic backend, you can see that option. A dynamic backend proxy determines the URL of the backend server dynamically during the processing of the request. The URL again determines the protocol used for the backside communication. So when you choose it as a dynamic backend, you don't have an option to update the backend URL over here, correct? Only when you choose it as a static backend, you have a provision of updating the backend URL. But when you use it as a dynamic backend, we are going to implement this using an XML and an XSLT file. So dynamic routing in data park can be implemented by using an XML and XSLT file. So we will see that at a later point of time, once we are done with this static backend and static from this tool. Yes, any questions so far? Uh, yeah, Ganesh, uh, yeah, yeah. like if the domain is same and uh, if there are like multiple contexts, then how will do that? No, domain, you mean to say, let's say this is one URL. And this is another URL, correct? So what is the scenario that you are talking about? No, not this, I am talking about the static, static. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, but you use it as a static backend? Yeah, static backend if we have like multiple context rooms. Like multiple URLs to be invoked? Yes. No, you cannot do that. Because when you choose it as a static backend, you have a provision of updating only one URL over here. And in those scenarios where you have multiple URLs to be invoked, you need to go with the dynamic backend only. Okay. Okay. So whenever, if you want to route a single request to multiple destinations, you will go with the dynamic backend. Dynamic. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because see what happens, Let's say this, the problem with the static backend is, let's say, today you have developed a service and from the dev environment you moved it to production and it is working fine. But maybe after a couple of months your backend team will come back to you and say that, that they are hosting their service in a different URL. So you have to change the backend URL. So what happens? You have to change it over here in the service and you have to move the entire service from dev to production again. Correct? Yeah. So that, that will be a difficult task of moving an entire service. So apart from that, what is the best practice is I will choose it as a dynamic backend. I will have my backend URLs in an XML file so I can easily move that XML file from dev to test and to prod. So rather than moving an entire service, it is very easy to move or deploy a new file to production. So in that way, it makes easy for us to... Yeah, XML, file, XML file in file system, right? Correct, yes. XML file in the file management system. Okay. So rather than moving the entire service, it is easy to move a single file into a production. So that's the reason okay. most of the services that we develop in real time is going to be a dynamic backend only. Okay. Okay. So you have to choose the backend type first, followed by, you can see SSL proxy. This is the SSL proxy profile, which is going to be a forward one. Correct. Because the, the reverse one will always comes into picture within the fence-side handler only, correct? Within HTTPS FSH. So this SSL proxy profile, what you are going to choose it over here, it is between data power and backend. You can see backside settings. It is between data power and backend. So between data power and backend means data power is going to act as a client and hence you will choose it as a forward. Okay. Followed by backside and frontside timeout. Frontside is nothing but between client and data power. Backside is nothing but between data power and backend. So for how much duration you want the connection to be idle between consumer to data power and between data power to the backend. Let's assume that I have kept it as 1.2 seconds. So when my consumer triggers a request to the data power, and if he doesn't receive any response from the data power within 120 seconds, then automatically my consumer will get a timeout error. 
because the connection is going to break after this duration what you have updated over here so you can decide depending upon your service development you can change this backside timeout and frontside timeout values okay okay followed by the other important object that we need to configure here is XML manager every data power service will have an XML manager either you can use a default XML manager or you can use your own service specific XML manager so if you want to create your own service specific XML manager you can hit on the plus you can see there's an option to create a new one so once you hit on the plus it will ask you to give a name to your XML manager let's say weather underscore XML manager followed by the main usage of this XML manager is it can be used as an XML parser what does this parser means so if you see in the XML manager there is a tab called XML parser just hit on that okay so you can see there are a few standard values which are mentioned here like XML bytes scanned equal to 4194304 bytes which is around like 4 MB which means at any point of time when you receive a message see when I say a message it might be a request or a response so whenever your data power service receives a message automatically your XML manager is going to parse it it is going to verify that message see as of now I have updated the value over here is 4194304 bytes which is like 4 MB right so if you receive a message which is more than 4 MB automatically your XML manager is going to reject that message okay clear yeah. so you can change these values as per your convenience sorry okay see let's say now I I may I may receive a message which is of 10 MB so I can update that value over here you can see here these settings do not impact resource allocation these settings are used only as part of threat protection we call it as XML threat protection okay. so you can change the values according to your convenience let's say I don't I don't know whether my message is going to be 4 MB 10 MB or whatever it might be I don't want to put any restriction so I can simply keep it as zero so when you keep it as a zero any message that comes to your data power service will be processed you are not putting a restriction on the message size right okay so because every service as I said will have an XML manager so when the message comes to the data power service automatically your XML parser will try to parse that message okay. so you can choose as per your convenience how much size you have to keep it as a passing limit followed by the other important usage of the data pass XML manager is caching now what does this caching means see before we go with the caching we have two kinds of services in data bar. one is a soap service the other one is a REST service so what is this difference between a SOAP and a REST any idea REST services or HTTP GET yes yes Vijay any idea REST and SOAP services uh, I, guess, I know how to test like web services using mm -hmm. soap. Mm -hmm. 
rest uh, what should just uh, the 200 responses okay mm -hmm. yeah see the difference yeah. is post all those actions yeah. right get yes yeah. absolutely http get http post all those are yeah see the difference is your soap services will have a specified format see here if you see you have soap envelope soap header and within the soap body you are going to pass those mandatory fields so every soap message will have a standard configuration like it will have an envelope it will have an header and it will have a body this is a soap service where you are passing the mandatory parameters as part of your body of the message whereas a rest service means you will pass the mandatory parameters in the URL itself. See, for example, your SOAP service URL will look like this. Let's assume that this is my data power service which I have configured and this will be my SOAP service URL. 7050 is the port number what you specified in the pencil handler followed by the URL part. So this will be your SOAP service URL. See here when I invoke this URL I don't know whether the city name is India city name is US or Australia correct because I don't know where I'm going to mention it because it will be inside my message whereas your HTTP get or address service means you will have the URL like this elevated value correct yes absolutely you will have everything being sent as part of your query parameters. Which is the more secure? The soap is the more secure. Soap is the secure. Yeah, soap is more secure because here, see, in, in my soap URL, I don't see what is a parameter at all. Whether it is a country name or what, or I'll say it's a city name, I, I'm not sure. But in the rest URL, you can see that this is a mandatory parameter. Yes. It's not that secured when you talk about, but in terms of getting the responses, because when you have, when you say that you have SOAP message, you have to form a specific message like this, where you have an envelope header and a body. But when you say in rest, it's a direct checking for this particular value. And also here, if you see, for this SOAP service, I don't know what is the request and hence I am not sure what will be the response, correct? Because depending upon the incoming parameter what you are going to send it, you will get a response. But when you look into your REST URL, I am pretty sure that I am invoking a parameter called country name equal to India. So even if I invoke thousand times, this will give me the correct response, same response every time, correct? because we are querying against a particular parameter. See, we call this as a query parameter. We are querying the backend by using a parameter being passed in the URL itself. So, unless until you change it, right? Which one? Unless until you change it, it will be yes. the same for all the times. Yes, absolutely, correct. Unless, until unless there is a change in the backend response at their end, so that we will be getting the same response. Right? Okay, yeah. So now, see, caching is nothing but, let's assume that 